Right. It is awesome to have everybody here. Uh, I'm Bill Clark, pastor here, and I counted a blessing to be able to be with you guys. I've actually got reconnected with some old friends from other churches, and uh, I, I want you right now, if you are not from Hickory Grove, when I count to three, say your church name. Okay, ready? One, two, three. We're glad you're here. Appreciate you telling us your name. Quiz us on that later. We'll, we'll be able to remember that. That's awesome. We're so glad that you're here, and I hope that you've experienced uh, uh, just a great fellowship of being here together with a lot of other teenagers. We have a lot of adults here as well. Uh, I wasn't going to miss this. I'm so glad to be able to be a part of this. And uh, Tim Blake, thanks for getting this organized, brother. We appreciate you and your leadership. Awesome. Come up here for a second. Yeah. So uh, we are very blessed. I remember when Tim was uh, in my office and said, you know, we think about getting uh, this guy named Jared Polson to come and speak at Hickory Gove. And I started getting the googly eyes, you know? It's like, man, that's, that's a great idea. You know who Jared Polson is? You know anything about it? Now I, now, yeah, now. It's that guy right there. That guy right there, yes. You know what he, yeah, what is that? Uh, basketball, plural? There's two. <laughs> I don't know. Yes, he, he shoots hoops. Sports ball. Sports ball. Yeah. Sports ball, yes. Yeah. yeah, so I had to, you know, tell him who Jared was, actually. And no, I'm just teasing. He knew who Jared was. But uh, we really do appreciate the, the fact that Tim has organized this. And, and what's really cool, you know, Tim and I and Missy and all of our staff, we talk often about, you know, what is it that God has us doing? What's this all about? Which is a good question to ask every now and then. And, and we're all about making disciples who make disciples disciples from generation to generation. And it's very important for to us to see the generations bridge together for, for the purpose of doing God's work. And that's why I love seeing all ages here in this place. But we're very committed to seeing, uh, equipping in every way you as teenagers to see you do what God has called you to do. I was having this thought even while we were singing these songs that you know a lot of people might want to say that, oh, you know what? The, as time passes, as the culture changes, it's just harder and harder for teens to really shine their light and live out their faith. And as I looked around the room, some of these teens I've seen, uh, I see so much awesomeness and uh, seeing them shine their light in their schools. We had Katie Ponder just up here last Sunday saying, I'm, uh, pray for me, I'm shining my light for Jesus on Simon Kenton's campus. So I, I love that and so glad that we're able to celebrate today. Well, we're going to have Mr. Jared Polson come on up uh, and uh, yeah, come on up, brother. man who needs no introduction and uh you know it's funny i was actually uh, i tried to talk the staff into letting me show the highlight reel of your game against maryland oh, and i was pushing hard for it i was geeking out a little bit i just texted him and said i got a highlight clip on my geek stick in my pocket if you want to use it i keep it there all the time no i'm just teasing i'm not that creepy i promise uh but uh, what i will say about about jared is jared i loved following jared as he played at uk uh of course as uk fans. There's something about someone from our state playing uh, out there on the court and someone who has stayed long enough for you to really get to know them and see them. You feel like that you do know them. And But what I liked following too is hearing about his faith and hearing about what he stood for. Hearing about how he shined his light wherever he went. Being involved in, in, uh, in faith-based things. And that really stuck out to me. And uh, I don't want to speak for Jared, but what I see in him is someone that's identity is isn't just in, hey, I played basketball for UK. His identity is in Christ and doing what he has called him to do. And he is using this opportunity. God has given him a great opportunity to share his story and his faith. Uh, and I love that he's taking opportunity to do that. So he's got something to say. The Lord has something to say through Jared tonight. And I just uh, ask for, uh, for you to open up your ears or your hearts uh, to hear about that. And I do have one more order of business that I need to do. Um, I got a, I know that all of y'all want a picture of Jared tonight, right? So can we just knock it out all at once tonight? Hold on, let me get this going here. I got to figure out how to work this. Do you feel better looking all of a sudden since Jared come up here? I, I like, feel like I'm more I feel like we're, Yeah. Hmm. Here we go, here we go. Right? We got to get everybody in. Everybody scooch in, scooch in, come on. We get the sweet spot there. Hey everybody! One, two, three. One, two, three. 
Wow. Good job, guys. <laughs> hey, guys, give it up for Jared. Hello? Does this thing work? We're good to go? Oh, wow. Thank you. Thank you. There's a good intro right there. Well, uh, my name is Jared Polson, um, like they just said, and um, I'm really excited to be here. I really love um, what this what this event is all about. It's just bringing people around the community that you know share the same goal of having a relationship with Jesus, and that really excites me. So when I heard about this, when my friend told me about it, and the opportunity to come speak, you know, I was all for it. And and so when when speakers come up and and they they try to talk to people, they they got to have a good start because no one wants to talk to a speaker that that no one knows about or doesn't have a good story. So I've asked a lot of professional speakers, how do you how do you engage the audience? And they said, you need two things. You need one to gain credibility. So somehow you gotta, you gotta show people that you know what you're talking about. Um, and two, you gotta tell them a really cool story that kind of engages them and gets them excited. And so I think I have the perfect story for that, especially for the basketball fans in here. Um, this was my sophomore year in college, and the NBA had a lockout. If you know what the NBA is, I hope you guys are basketball. Well, fans, the NBA is the, the big top league, and so they had a lockout, um, and that meant that the NBA got canceled for a half a season, and the players that played in that league, they weren't even allowed to work out in their facilities, so they had to find somewhere else to work out, and John Calipari, who is our coach, he knows every single person in this world, and so he had all these NBA players come to our gym, and so the Oklahoma City Thunder team came, um, Kevin Durant, James Harden at the time, Russell Westbrook, um, there's a lot of other players, John Rondo, John Wall, basically an NBA All-Star team came to UK and they worked out for a couple of weeks. And, and so part of the workouts is, you know, lifting, you know, individual workouts. But every day at about four o'clock, we would all gather in the gym and we would play pickup basketball. And so usually, you know, we had 10 or 10 to 12 players on our team every year. I get to play in a game, something like that. But, but not this time. In these two weeks, there was literally an NBA All-Star game going on in the Craft Center. And so every game, I just kind of went in there and I knew I wasn't ever going to get in the game. I was just content to watch. You know, I was looked up to these people and, and so I would just sit on the sideline by myself watching it, blah, blah, blah. And so one, one day uh, the, the players, I guess, got tired or something and so they literally had no one else in the gym and so they had nine players. They needed one more. So they looked at me. They probably didn't know who I was at the time and they, they just said, you want to play? You want, we need ten. And so sure enough, I'm, I'm in there. I'm playing with, you know, an NBA All-Star team and, and so in pickup ball, whenever you said set picks, if you know what that is, a pick is when, you know, your guy comes and so you can go around it. When they set picks, there's no, there's no hedges, it's, it's you switch. And so, I'm guarding my man, I'm just trying not to make a mistake, all that good stuff, and, and so my man decides to set a pick on a player, and so that means I have to switch on to the player that comes off the screen. Well, I was on the wing, the player so happened to be LeBron James, one of the best players in the entire world. And so that means me, six foot two, little white kid, trying to guard literally the best player in the world. Um, and so I remember he, he kind of backed me down a little bit. He was dribbling you know, at the three-point line. I kind of stuck my arm out a little bit. I showed him that I was really strong. Um, and, and so I do that. He dribbles a couple times. He realizes how strong I am. He realizes he can't get past me. And so he shoots a fadeaway three-pointer, and he misses it. And so now I can say that I stopped the best player in the world from scoring. I actually shut him down. So, first of all, <laughs> and I tell that story because, you know, you know, I was a walk-on. I went to UK. You know, I didn't get playing time at all my first two years. So some people like to, you know, say he didn't even play that much. Well, take that, haters. All right, here we go. Uh, but, but like I said, I'm excited to be here. Um, I just want to tell you kind of, kind of um, my story, um, my testimony. A lot, of, a lot of basketball stories, but at the same time, um, what I really think matters is my relationship with Jesus Christ, first and foremost. So I just kind of want to tell you my background, tell you a few stories in between, and then kind of wrap it up. And, and so, my background. I am from Kentucky, um, like Tim said, and I'm from a small town called Wilmore, um, which you guys have probably never heard of. It's right south of Lexington. And I'm from a a big family, a, bit, a family of five, and I'm smack dab in the middle. I have two older brothers, two younger sisters, um, and so as a kid, my, my passions were, were one, my, my parents told me to read my Bible, love Jesus, and then my other thing was basketball. I loved basketball from the day I was born, um, and when you're in Kentucky, when you live in Kentucky, if you 
like basketball, you want to be a Kentucky Wildcat. That's like the ultimate dream. And so for me as a kid, that was no different. Um, I remember thinking about it all the time. I would watch every single game on TV by the time I was like three years old. Um, I would play basketball with my brothers. And when my brothers didn't play, I decided to play by myself. And when I played by myself, I had to make it fun. So I would, I would create like 64 team tournaments on a piece of paper. And I would play every single game against myself all the way through. Kentucky always ended up winning in the national championship. Um, usually on a buzzer beater against Duke or Louisville, I kind of split it up every once in a while. So that's kind of my background. I love Kentucky basketball, um, but I also grew up in a Christian home. My parents um, raised me like that. And so, you know, every night, probably like a lot of you guys, you read your Bible every night, you say your prayers and all that good stuff. But um, I would say towards middle school and high school, um, my relationship with God was, was not how it was, or not how it is now. I kind of saw God as someone kind of up in the sky, this really crazy being or person, whatever he was. I just saw him up in the sky. He didn't really care about what was going on down here. He was just kind of, you know, keeping a tally. You know, when I would do good things, when I would do good things to people, um, he, would, he would be proud of me and he was happy with me. But when I made mistakes and when I sinned and, and maybe when I wasn't praying enough, reading the Bible enough, he was going to be really disappointed in me. And so I didn't really have that relationship that you guys hear a lot, that relationship with God. I was a Christian, but, you know, it, there was just something missing. And so I'll talk about that later. Um, to, to give you a little more background, a lot of people always ask me, how in the world did you get on the UK team? Because they look at me, I don't look like a basketball player. Um, I look like I'm 10 years old. I have a baby face. Uh, and so people always just kind of say, you were a basketball player? That, does make, that makes no sense. So I want to tell you the story because it really is kind of a miracle story. Um, it, in high school, uh, I, I was a pretty good basketball player. You know, I loved it, like I said, but I wasn't really getting recruited by any of the big colleges. Um, even up to my senior year, I had a few smaller NAI schools looking at me, um, and that was really all everyone or the only teams that were showing interest. And so I didn't really get excited about that. You know, I remember my senior year of high school. Um, almost during, during the middle of the season, my coach brought me into his office and, and he said, you know, we need to start thinking about recruiting because you're about to go to college in a half a year. We need to figure out where you're going. And I remember telling him, I think I'm just going to go to UK and, and not play basketball. I think I'm just going to quit basketball, you know, and just get a good education and go from there. And so that was kind of my mindset. You know, I, I knew I was kind of good, but I never really had that much confidence in myself. And, and so senior year rolls around, the season's going through, um, and we did really good that year. We made it all the way to the Sweet 16. Um, and so once you get to the Sweet 16, that's the state tournament, a lot of different coaches start coming. And so I remember kind of in those tournaments, I was like, God, I don't, I don't know if you're listening or, or blah, 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 but if, if you want me to, to go somewhere, if you want me to play basketball, please help me do well. And I realized that was really a selfish prayer at the time, but God really instilled some great, like, I played the, my best basketball I'd ever played in my life in those games leading up to the tournament. Tournament. And because of that, a lot of other colleges came on the trail. And, and so yeah, after the season, we, we had that awesome run. There were some coaches, there were some other D1s calling, but still nothing that got me excited. My dream was to play for UK. And, and so I remember I was at school a couple weeks after the season. I was getting kind of frustrated. You know, I had to make a decision soon. Like you guys, maybe there's some seniors in here. Yeah, you eventually have to make a college decision. And so I tried every trick in the book. I would peel off leaves. Like if, if it falls on this side, then I'm going to blah. If it feels off this side, I'm going here, flip a coin. I didn't know what to do, but I just felt like God was telling me to wait for some reason. He just said, have patience. And so I did. And, and it was in my senior year, um, I was in homeroom and my coach called, or, or my dad called from work. And my dad never calls from work. He knows I'm in school. I was kind of confused, but I answered it. And he said, um, leave your phone on loud today because you're going to get a call from a, a UK coach. And I didn't believe him. I thought he was playing a joke on me or something like that. And then later on that day, my, my coach brought me into his office and he said the exact same thing. He said, make sure your phone is on loud. A UK coach is going to call you. And so at that point, I'm kind of getting nervous. I, I realize that it's actual thing. And, and so sure enough, the last period of the day, fifth block, I had an office aide and, and my phone rings. It's a random number. Usually I just, you know, decline it. I don't want to talk to somebody random. Um, but I answer it and he says, this is Coach Orlando Antigua um, from UK Basketball. We want to know if you want to come up there and play pickup ball with us for a couple weeks. We're looking for an in-state guard to come on the team. 
And so, again, I thought he was kidding. I hung up the phone. I peed my pants real quick. And then <laughs> I had to uh, get ready for the, the most important two weeks of my life. And so I remember I, I went up there the very first day. And Coach Robick, one of the assistant coaches, he kind of gives me a tour of the whole place. You know, the craft center, if you've never been in there, it really is an intimidating place. I remember going into the weight room um, and meeting Coach Rock Oliver, the strength coach. You know, everyone thinks he's intimidating. He just looks at me up and down. He's like, who the heck are you? Uh, and so I go in there, and then they send me into the locker room to get dressed. So I go in there and all of a sudden I see all these players that you guys might remember. There's all um, these players that are about to go to the NBA. So I came in the year after um, Eric Bledsoe was there, DeMarcus Cousins, Patrick Patterson, Darius Miller, um, Josh Harrelson, a lot more guys. So they're all just sitting on the stools on this side of the locker room. And so I'm like, I'm too intimidated. I come over here, I sit on this side of the stool um, and I just kind of you know, take my shirt off, put another shirt on, put my shoes on, just trying to mind my own business. They're all kind of looking at me trying to figure out who I was. I had no introduction. They probably thought I was a new manager trying to come on the team, whatever. And so I get my shoes on. I'm ready to go up. I, I look up and all, uh, um, the, 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 one of my childhood heroes came in the door. His name was John Wall. And so you guys know who John Wall is. He's, a, he's really famous around Kentucky. So John Wall like, comes storming in for some reason, but he just stops dead in his tracks and he just looks over at me real quick. And then he looks back, he just is like, whatever. And then he just looks over again, and he just stares at me for a second. And I can't repeat what exactly he said to me, uh, but he asked me a very valid question. He, he said, who the are you? Uh, <laughs> and so uh, it was one, that I, on one hand, I was really excited because my hero just talked to me. But on the other hand, it was a really embarrassing question, but it was a valid question at that. And so those whole two weeks were, were really crazy. Um, I got dunked on a few times. Times. I'm not ashamed to say that. Um, I don't even remember if I did well in those scrimmages, but um, I guess I did good enough. And so two weeks later, after that time had passed, I go in there. I'm kind of just feeling nervous because they're not saying anything about you know letting me be on the team, scholarship, any of that stuff. And so I go in there one day, um, and no one's there. So I guess they had canceled Open Gym. I'm like, all right, they're not even telling me that Open Gym's canceled. I'm just, I'm just gonna go home. But I remember hearing that voice again. Just stay, just stay about 10 minutes and shoot around. And so I did. I grabbed a ball and I'm just shooting around. And all of a sudden, the director of operations comes by. His name's Martin Newton, and he, and he says, Jared, can I talk to you for a second? And so at that point, I'm, I'm thinking the worst, you know, I'm like, he's just going to tell me we don't want to go in your direction, thanks for coming out, but, you know, it's just not going to work out. So he sits me down and he says, um, if you want a spot on the team, it's yours. And so I was, I was crazy, I tried to act all composed, I tried to say, you know, I need a week to think about it, all that good stuff, try that professional. I didn't need a week to think about it, um, but they gave me that. And so. Um, at that point, I peed my pants again. I had a really, uh, <laughs> probably a bladder problem after the, this two weeks had ended. And so I remember calling my dad, and he was so excited. And, and that was kind of um, how I got there. Really a, a crazy story coming from a person that, you know, never even thought he was going to play college basketball to playing on one of the best programs in the country. And, and so that first lesson, I, I would just tell you guys, is patience is really a big key to life. Um, and patience is one of the most hard things to do because it kind of requires you to kind of do nothing. You know, you can do things during times of waiting, but, but if God wants you to be somewhere, He's going to put you there. Um, and, and I can tell you that personally. I had no clue that that would ever happen to me, um, but God wanted me at UK for a reason, and I just had to, had to have enough patience um, to let that happen. So I'm on the UK team my freshman year. It's a complete culture shock to me. Um, I didn't mention Wilmore is just like almost like an Amish town. I don't, it's, it's really crazy. Like the sign going into Wilmore says, Welcome to Wilmore. Jesus loves you. It, it's really crazy. It's like a Christian town. And so I, come, I came from a really Christian home. Um, I, I never really got out much. Our, our, trips on vacation were to an upper peninsula in Michigan. I never even barely went to Lexington, so I'm really from a sheltered home. And so, going from that to UK, not only to UK, not only to college, but to UK basketball. And so there's a lot of, you know, stereotypes about UK basketball players, or even just college athletes in general. Um, you know, they get into trouble or whatever like that. And so, I was a little nervous going in. Um, and I'll tell you one quick story. We, uh, we went to Canada my freshman year, before my freshman year actually, in the summer. 
and um, it was a treat for our family. You know, when we had a birthday, our mom and dad would take us to McDonald's. Like we got excited about that, or Wendy's. Wendy's, if we were really lucky, because Wendy's is better than McDonald's. And so I remember we went to this crazy restaurant. We got off the plane, um, and this restaurant had everything you could possibly imagine. Every meal was like fifty or a hundred dollars. So I'm just looking at the menu. I have no clue what any of this stuff says. Um, but there's one thing on the menu that said fillet mignon. Um, and so for the older people, yeah, you get it. Philip Mignon is actually filet mignon. I had no clue what that was, but you know, I was like, hey, that looks good. It looks, I think it's steak. I'm going to get that. And so filet mignon changed my life. That's my favorite food by far. Um, but yeah, it was just a culture shock. And so the biggest thing for me freshman year was finding community. And that's really what this night is about. That's what Nate talked about. And I found a community through Christian Student Fellowship. Um, I knew that I had to. And so in Christian Student Fellowship, I found a group of guys um, that were kind of striving after Jesus in a way that I had never seen before. You know, when you're in college, your parents can't make you read your Bible anymore, and your parents can't make you pray, and your parents can't make you go to church. You're on your own. And so I go to this place, and there's just all these college students worshiping and praising Jesus on their own. Not because their parents told them to, because they wanted to. And that really changed my life. I found a community... Um, and I got in a core group, a little small group, to where we could talk about, you know, different things, different things that were going on in our life, studying the Bible. Um, and we'd also have just different worship services and community events and service events. And I promise that, that, that freshman year when I, when I joined that, I don't know what I would have done um, in my other three years of college if I hadn't started with that community. There are so many temptations in college. There are so many temptations right now where you guys are in middle school and high school. You know, I talked to some of the people and, and some people make the most regrets in their life in their high school years. And, and the best thing I could tell you guys is to get into a community. Take, take Nate's advice. Find a group of people in your school, on your team, and strive after Jesus um, the way you want to and the way that group wants to. And, and so for me, community was the biggest thing I learned freshman year. And that really helped me out um, with my faith side going on. Um, my sophomore year well, it was kind of my, my down year, and I always like to tell this story. Um, as far as basketball goes, freshman year I came in knowing that I wasn't getting any playing time. I was by far the worst player on my team. Um, but my sophomore year, we had a lot of guys leave, um, and so we had one point guard coming in, and that was it. And so I was like, man, if I work, if I work hard, I'm going to be able to be the second string point guard. I might be able to play for Kentucky. It's cool to, you know, sit the bench, but this might be my year to play for a national championship team. And so I, put, I worked so hard that summer. I put in so much um, hard work and dedication. And so I thought this was going to be my year to shine. Um, and it turned out to be the exact opposite. I remember one game in particular, we were up by 30 or 40 points. You know, Anthony Davis, Anthony Davis was on that team, Michael Kidd, Gilchrist, all those great guys. We beat a lot of teams by 50, but I got to go into a game in the last three minutes. And so, you know, the last three minutes of the game, you, the game's already in hand. You can really do whatever you want. People are just kind of yelling, shoot, and they're cheering for the walk-ons to come in. And, and so for me, I didn't like that because I wanted to prove to Coach Calipari that I was serious about basketball. I didn't just want to go in there and put on a circus show. I wanted to say, if you're going to give me three minutes to play, I'm going to play my very hardest. Um, and so that three minutes did not work out the way I wanted it to. Um, I remember I had about two or three turnovers. Um, I almost airballed a free throw and I let my man score on me a couple times. Basically all the no-nos of basketball I did in, in three little measly minutes. And so um, that night I was, I was miserable. I put so much attention to basketball and, and so I went to bed at midnight and I, well I laid in bed at midnight. I didn't sleep and I didn't sleep at all that night. I laid in bed for seven hours and all I could think about was those bonehead mistakes I made in, in that game previously. Basketball had started to consume so much of my mind that I couldn't even sleep. And so the next day, I go into practice an hour early, and I'm like, I'm, I'm, I'm still going for this thing. I'm going to prove to Cal that that was just a fluke. So I go in there. No one's in there except the coach, and he offers to rebound for me. So I'm getting a good workout, um, and Coach Calipari comes in about five minutes later. And it was kind of weird because Coach Cal, he never comes in. Um, before practice. He comes in right at practice. When you see Cal, you better get ready because we're practicing. And so he comes in. I kind of look. I don't, I don't think much of it. He just kind of staring at me for a little bit, watching me shoot. And then he just blurts out, most of my players uh, get better under me, but I think you've gotten worse. Um, and so, uh, and so uh, as a basketball player, as an athlete, it's hard enough to have confidence in yourself, but when your coach has 
seemingly no confidence in you, it's going to really wreck you. And so that was really the downfall and kind of the rock bottom of my basketball career. At that point, I honestly wanted to quit. It was cool to play for Kentucky, but you know, if my coach didn't believe in me, I didn't believe in myself, there was no reason um, to play. And so that, that quote, although it sounds bad, I think Coach Calipari was doing it for a reason. He was kind of giving me tough love, and I'm actually glad he did it because I learned a lot of lessons through my sophomore year. Um, and the first one was, um, you, you just talked about it, it was identity. I put so much of my identity into basketball. I basically put all of my identity into basketball. I spent all my time working out. I spent all my time making sure Coach Cal knew I was a good player or, or trying to in, um, impress the fans or trying to impress my teammates or my family. But it all revolved around basketball. I put all of my eggs into the basketball basket. Um, and so that really taught me that you can't do that. Um, when, when basketball didn't work out that year, I was miserable. I was depressed. And my mom and dad didn't raise me to do that. They raised me to have an identity in Jesus Christ. And so for you guys, it may not look like Kentucky basketball, but we all put our identity into different things. Right now it might be a, a girlfriend or a boyfriend or maybe it's a job for the parents or maybe it's your family or in middle school and high school there's all these cliques and all these friends. We can, we can put, all, put our identity into all of these things, but if our identity is not wrapped around Jesus and centered around Jesus, we're going to be miserable. I can tell you from experience. And so that was the first thing. And I remember um, during my sophomore year, I was praying with a friend. And this friend sometimes hears from God a little bit. He kind of has a, nice, a really good relationship with him, so he can kind of hear things. And, and my friend was praying over me. Um, and he was just praying some, you know, some generic things. And all of a sudden, he just says, I think God is telling me that, that his favorite moments with you are when you're in your bed at night and you're just talking to him. And so I was kind of confused by that. First hand, he didn't know. I, I always like to pray at night. I always sit up in my bed actually with the lights on and I just pray and I just talk to God pretty normally. And so he didn't know that. So I was like, man, this actually might be from God. And the second thing um, I really learned was, was I, I was thinking that, that I had to impress God. I had to do all these things to try to impress him and make him love me. And I go back to that, to that view I had of God in high school. You know, I thought he was a God in the sky um, that was just really, you know, happy when I did good things for him and, and sad when I sinned or made a mistake. Um, but in that moment, I realized that God really just wants a relationship with us. Um, it it kind of went from a God in the sky to a God right here, a God in my heart. And when I figured that out, my identity completely changed. My identity turned, you know, if not from basketball and not from UK or, or anything like that. But my identity was, I'm a child of God. And so that was huge for me. And that's huge for you guys um, as well. And so my identity was huge. Um, and so after that, I kind of had that prayer. I kind of had that low point in my basketball career. And I just had to realize another lesson. I had to give my two coins to the team. And what I mean by that, there's a, there's a narrative in the Bible, and, it, and there's this woman um, that goes to church, and all these Pharisees are in the church, and, they, and they're pretty rich, they have all this money, and they're putting all this money into the offering plate. And everyone's looking at them, and there's all these oohs and ahs. You know, this guy gave that much, this guy gave that much. And then there's a really poor woman um, that comes in, and she just has two little coins, two little pennies, and she just puts them in. I mean, Jesus looks at her and he looks at, the, and he looks at the Pharisees and he says, this woman just gave more than any of you all. This woman gave more. Even though it was just two coins, she gave everything she had. She sacrificed everything she had for me. And so that year, I had to realize that my talent really didn't matter anymore. It didn't, it didn't matter that I was one of the worst players. It didn't matter that Coach Cal didn't have confidence in me. It didn't even matter that I didn't have confidence in myself. I had two coins to give to the team. And I, it was up to me to decide whether to use it. And so for me, um, me and a buddy named Kyle Wiltger, we decided that we were going to go into practice an hour early every single day um, and just work out, work out an hour. We decided that we were going to give our two coins to the team. We weren't worried about playing time. We weren't worried about the coaches. We just wanted to say, this is our talent. We want to give everything we have. And so we did that. And so for you guys, it's the same way. Everyone in this room is different. Some of us are athletes. Some of us are not. We all have different talents. We all have different gifts. Some of those gifts might look better. Some might, some might be the, you know, the star on the athletic team, the star on the basketball team, or somebody might you know, be a rock star. I don't know what there is. We all have different talents and gifts to give. 
but it's up to us to decide to do that. It's not about our talent. It's, a, it's about our heart behind the talent. And so I had to learn that. No matter, even if I was the worst player, I had to give what I have. And it's really hard because a lot of us think that we don't really have anything to give. We don't have enough talents. We're just kind of going through life. Um, and it's kind of meaningless. But I promise you, God wants you to use your talents. And God wants that relationship with you. Like, like, that, like Blake said in that prayer, his favorite moments with you are just when you're talking to him. He really does want that relationship. Um, and that's something I really had to learn. There's one verse that I really like um, that kind of goes along with this. Colossians 3.23 Whatever you do, work it out with all your heart. as working for the Lord, not for men. And so whatever you do, whatever it is, if you have a job, if you have people in your class, if, if you're leading a Bible study, whatever you're doing, work at it for the Lord. Not for men's approval, but for the Lord's approval. So, sophomore year gets over. Um, my junior year, that was kind of my breakout year in basketball, the Maryland game and all that good stuff. And I don't really want to talk too much about that. But that year I just kind of had to realize that, that life is more enjoyable when you focus on what you can give to the world and not what you can gain from the world. And so my junior year I just realized, you know what, I'm just going to work as hard as I can. And because of that, I actually got to live out my dream you know, of playing for Kentucky, not sitting on the bench, but actually playing for my dream school. And so that was really cool just to learn that lesson. But, but after my junior year, I got a chance to go on a mission trip um, to Ethiopia. And Ethiopia is a country in Africa. And so it was in the summer right before my senior year um, and about eight or, eight or nine athletes went with me. So a bunch of UK athletic people um, from different teams. We all went on this mission trip. Um, and, I, and I just want to tell you a few stories that I kind of um, really remembered and that kind of impacted my life. The first story was about a woman we met. And, and so when you go to, if you've never been on a mission trip before, usually they have tasks and different assignments for you to do. This day we were giving out food and bread to different people, some, some poor people in the community. Um, and so we go to this first woman, and she kind of has a bread stand, and that's kind of how she makes a living. She's a single mom. She has a lot of different kids. Um, and so she's just trying to provide for them as best as she could. And so we go to her booth. We give her some food. Um, we pray for her. And that's that. We just think it's over. She's really thankful. Um, and so we actually go back to a community um, kind of close to where she was that night, so about five hours later. And so we see this same woman. But this woman was not, you know, providing for her family and hogging all the bread herself. This woman was out in the community and she was handing that same bread we had given her to every single person in that community that was hungry. And so that was the first thing. The second woman I want to tell you guys about is really a woman that, that changed my life, honestly. We went into this house um, in a village called Cora, and this village was kind of the, the disease-ridden village. And back in the olden days, they would take all the people that were really sick um, and that might be contagious, and they literally just shipped them into this area to basically rot and die. Um, and that sounds really sad. And so this village is a lot better now, but there's still um, over 180,000 people living in a square mile. Um, and if you can kind of wrap that around your head, it's about 10 to 15 different pe or 10 to 15 people living in every single house. Um, and the houses are not what you would expect. Not a house like you would see in America. The houses are, you know, a tarp to cover the to cover the rain out and a dirt floor and maybe a bed or a couch or something like that for the mom and some of the kids to sleep on. Um, and so we go into this room. And we see this lady laying in one of the beds. Um, and this lady looks a lot different than, than you or I would look. This lady had been a victim of leprosy, um, which is a disease that our immune systems are too um, good to even catch nowadays. But this woman had suffered from leprosy for a long time. And so we saw her, her fingers were completely cut off. Um, her knees down were completely cut off. Um, and she had a dent in both sides of her head. And she honestly looked like a skeleton more than she did a person. And so we go in there, you know, we have food to give, we have a few supplies, but we're, we're just thinking, you know, what is this really going to do for her? And so we, we kind of give it to her and, and she's really happy. She's so thankful. She's one of the most joyful people I've ever met in my life. And so I remember we, we go to pray for her and I try to put my hand on her head just because, you know, that's what you do when you pray for people. You put your hand on them. And I remember she took her arm or whatever she had left of an arm and she kind of batted it away. Um, and she told the translator, don't let, him put my, don't let him put his arm on me. I don't want him to get sick. In that crazy situation, she was more worried about me 
been herself. And so after the prayer, I remember me and my me and my other friend, we walked out. Um, and as we were walking out, she just she kept saying this phrase over and over again. Um, and it was obviously a different language. We didn't know what it was. Um, but our first reactions were like, maybe she's disappointed in us. Maybe another set of Americans come in and give them some food and then just walk right out and never see them again. Or maybe we didn't give her enough food or we didn't stay long enough. We thought she might have been mad at us. But the translator said, all she's saying is, God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Over and over and over again. And so this woman taught me a lot of lessons. And the first lesson is... It's good to, to go after your dream, and it's good to live out your dreams, kind of like I had. I had the ultimate kind of success story for myself. I got to live out my dream of going to UK. I played for my dream school. And then I saw this woman who literally had nothing. We found out that she had been laying in that bed for the last 18 years of her life. She had not moved from that spot. And so we see this woman who literally had nothing that this world has to offer. She has every reason to complain and be miserable. But this woman was still learn, um, living to serve others, and she didn't care about that. She chose to have joy even um, in a bad time. And so, to, to tell you guys, kids, it's a youth rally. I can tell you from experience, um, when you try to live out your dream, I think it's a good thing, but I think we need to start living out different dreams. A lot of us as kids, you know, we want to be that success story. We want to go to the NBA or we want to go to the NFL or, or we want to be a famous musician or we have all these things. We want to be famous. All these things we look up to and strive to do. Um, but I can promise you, if you do that selfishly, if you go after your dreams with selfish ambition, it's not going to bring you joy. It's not going to bring you true fulfillment. Um, I saw a woman who had nothing and she was more joyous. She had more fulfillment in her heart than I did. And so that didn't really make sense to me, but I kind of figured it out. The second, the second thing I learned from her um, was really simple. And so as Christians, you know, there's a lot of different things. We always say, how do we live a good Christian life? And I think this woman really had it figured out. And it's really simple. It's the two greatest commandments in the Bible. The number one, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, all your strength. And number two, love your neighbor as yourself. This woman exemplified that so beautifully. She, she loved God. She had a relationship with God. She was telling us about her testimony and her Christian walk. And then she chose, despite her circumstances, despite every reason to complain, she chose to love someone else. She chose to love me more than herself. That's where true fulfillment comes from. Um, and that's where true fulfillment comes um, in our lives. It doesn't have to be you know, going to Africa. It doesn't have to be anything crazy. But when you have a relationship with God, not that relationship where He's in the sky, but a real relationship with Him when you're talking to Him, when you're reading your Bible, and then when you choose to love someone else more than yourself. We live in a culture, we live in America where people will try to tell you, look after yourself. When you're making a big decision, always focus on what's best for me. But I think that's why America is kind of different than it used to be. It's, it's, good to, it's good to look after yourself sometimes, but when we're making big decisions, it's better to say what's going to affect the most people and what's going to help lead the most people to Christ. Um, and so this woman kind of exemplified that. I had a chance to go to, to Israel this past summer, and I'm almost done, so don't worry. I had a chance to go to Israel um, on a trip with my church, and so we kind of followed the entire New Testament. Everywhere, you know, Jesus walked, and then obviously Paul the Apostle walked. We went everywhere. We kind of followed their trail, so we got to see some really cool things, but I remember we got to Rome, um, and we go to this monastery. It's a really quiet place, and we go up to these kind of stones in the ground, and it's all blocked off, so we realize there has to be some sort of significance. Um, and there's about 50 there's about 50 feet of stones and so the the guide kind of tells us about it and he says this is the last 50 steps um, where Paul the Apostle the Paul you guys probably heard of him in the Bible he wrote a lot of books um, that was his last 50 steps of his life before he was beheaded for his faith before he died before he was a martyr for Jesus so when she told us that we all kind of got silent we were all just thinking about it um, but I really think um, that Paul kind of had um, his purpose in life. He, he kind of knew his purpose in life. And that was just to bring as many people um, to Jesus as he could. And that his purpose was the two greatest commandments. Again, having a relationship with God and loving other people along the way. And so our, our, our um, pastor kind of told us a sermon. You know, he said, just like Paul, we all have 50 steps left in our lives. You know, we have some young kids in here. We have some older adults. But every single one of us have that in common. We all have 50 steps left in, the, in this life, you know, before we're 
taken away. And so I think Paul really had an eternal perspective on life, and that's why he did so well. He wasn't really worried about you know, current circumstances. He wasn't really worried about you know, things that were going to happen today or tomorrow. He always had heaven on his mind, and that's why it was so easy for him you know, to completely sacrifice and lay down his life um, for Jesus. And so that's what I think we need to have. That's what I need to have is an eternal perspective, setting our minds on you know, things above, not on earthly things. In America, it's so easy to just cut up, get caught up in our day-to-day lives. But I think it's really important when we make decisions, little decisions, big decisions, to have that eternal perspective. I heard this, um, in a, I think in a magazine I saw this. Um, they said, five minutes after you die, when you make a big decision, think about what you would do five minutes after you die. So you're dead five minutes after you look back at your life and you say, what would I have done differently? Um, and so that's really something I always think about when I'm making decisions, whether that's a career decision or, or how I treat people. Um, and it's the same way. Have that eternal perspective um, in this life. And now as we are listening to that song, this is not our home. Um, heaven is our home. This is just a temporary place. And so it's really important to just have that mindset. And I'll, and I'll close with this. I remember um, praying one night, sitting up in my bed and, and praying and talking to God. And um, I was just kind of telling him, like, my testimony is not all that great. After college, you're going to give me an opportunity um, to tell people about you. But no one wants to hear a story about a kid that just grew up in a Christian home and is a Christian because his parents are. And, and so I was kind of just wrestling with that. And I, and I didn't hear it audibly, but I really think God told me this. He, he said, you know, my testimony, your testimony is not about yourself. It's about me. And he was talking about himself. So again, we all have our different stories. Um, and all of our stories look different. But we all of our testimonies have one thing in common. It's that Jesus saved us and that he wants a relationship with us here on this earth. But he also wants to give us eternal life in heaven. And so if I think we can think about that, I think if we can have this eternal perspective and realize we're not here, to, we're, we're here to do a lot of different things. But all of the things that we have in this life, whether it's our job, whether it's school, with athletics, it's all supposed to point towards God. We have to have our identity wrapped up in Him. And when we think in that mindset, I think a lot of our decisions are going to look like, or a lot of our decisions are going to look different, um, and this world is going to be a better place. So uh, that's about all I got, and I'll give it back to you. <laughs>